Welcome. First, a brief history of the Turks. There were Turks even before the Gok Turks. They are even referred to as the Proto-Turks. The fact that the Turks speak the Turkish language refers specifically to the Turkish language as a group. There is no direct connection between the normal Turkish we speak today and the contemporary Turkish language. If you traveled back to before Christ, you might find yourself in front of a Turk ancestor and say, what? If we look at these historical appearances a bit, we most prominently see the emergence of the Huns. But in North Africa and Asia, the Turks are almost at the root of all societies. The Turkish figure, the Turkish DNA is present. The religious choices of the Turks have progressed in very different ways. So when we look at history, as I said, this is a summary and I won't go too far back. There is Tengrism. They have looked into Manichaeism, Judaism and Buddhism. Then there is Orthodoxy and later Islam. There is a shaman culture, for example, the way you hit the board comes from the past of Turkish culture, specifically from pre-Islamic Turkish culture. In the 6000s BC, the Turks began to gradually abandon their nomadic lifestyle and even started to raise sheep. By the 1700s, they were spreading towards the Tian Shan Mountains and Altai Mountains. The first distinct Turkish state was the Scythians. I said that I would examine the history of these Turks, but they are spreading across the world so quickly and in a warrior-like manner that, within this video, they begin to collect tribute from China during the 600s. In the 500s, by around the year 600, they were receiving a tribute of 100,000 tons of silk from China each year. China pays for every love, so to speak. Because the Turks are very warlike, they can cut off and control the Silk Road and the Turks expand very rapidly. The important question is in which world we will see these Turks between the years 600 and 1000. Between 600 and 1000 the Turks were not very close to the Arabs. This is because the spread of Islam intervened in the Turkish region. The Turks are being prevented from establishing relations with the Eastern Rome Empire commercially. They are sending an envoy to Eastern Rome. However, at the time when Islam began to spread, the Turks were experiencing some difficulties. We are not currently talking about a Muslim Turkish concept. We are in the year 610. Because after the 600s, the biggest event was the Sassanids. The Sassanids, along with the Persian Empire, were neighbors to Eastern Rome. They were still very powerful forces for that period. The Sassanids captured Jerusalem in 614. In 619, we refer to Byzantium as Byzantium. They are taking Egypt. This means they are also bringing a great trouble to Eastern Rome. They are deep within Anatolia. They are advancing so quickly and powerfully and somewhat ruthlessly that they will soon become a significant threat within Europe. It is believed that the slowdown of this expansion is also related to Islam. However, the Sassanids advancing until 628 and then declaring peace is a separate issue. The migration of Prophet Muhammad to Medina in 622 was a significant event. Now, there was no acceleration in the spread of Islam until it clashed with the Jews in the region, until problems arose with them. With the transition to Medina, Islam is gaining momentum. However, by the year 630, when the Kaaba was captured, Islam now has a center. Whenever something becomes central, for example, why is Jerusalem so important? Trump goes and declares Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Whenever something has a center, people believe in it more strongly. In 632, Prophet Muhammad passed away. After his death, we see a two-year caliphate period of Hazrat Abu Bakr. Then comes Umar, but both Hadza. During the time of Abu Bakr and also during the time of Hazrat Umar, there was no Islam that valued multiculturalism and art. It was trying to expand. In fact, it was attempting to conquer the region that is today known as Syria. There is a very short period of 10 years between 634 and 644 during the time of Abu Bakr and Umar. During his caliphate, Islam spread significantly. Where was it conquered? Let me tell you, Jerusalem was conquered. Damascus was conquered. Iran, Iraq, which at that time was of course the Persian land, is being referred to in terms of today's map. These areas are being conquered. As Islam spreads to these areas, faith increases. As faith increases, more people are willing to fight for Islam. If you take a close look at the history of religions, there is no other religion that has spread as rapidly in just 150 years. Islam spread and became an empire within 150 years. In other words, there has been no belief that has spread so rapidly across the world until the rise of Islam. In Omar's era, military organization formed, stability kept in occupied territories, tax system applied in these areas. Now, while Islam is advancing a bit towards the West, Buddhism is spreading in the East. Do Buddhism and Islam overlap significantly? 
not during that period, Buddhism is spreading rapidly into China. As I said, this video is actually about the war of four empires. While the Chinese become Buddhists, you will soon see that the other, Zelduchlu, choose various religions and so on. Islam is rapidly trying to advance towards Anatolia and North Africa. The year 643 marks a significant period for Islam, known as the Battle of Nihavend. This was a major war that led the Sassanids to abandon their Zoroastrian beliefs. Islam is already showing a significant spread here. The population of Iran is rapidly moving to Istanbul. And the biggest event is that the Arabs are now encountering the Byzantines in Alexandria and Cairo in Egypt. For the first time, there is direct contact. And Alexandria and Cairo are falling. The Arabs are also capturing these places under the Islamic faith known as the Islamic Union. This place has a very high tax value and is one of the locations that benefits from the economy through dowries producing grain yields and is truly a center of trade in the world. Therefore, the fall of these places significantly slows down the Byzantine Empire. It's also very bad for their image. At that time, someone starting from scratch is taking Alexandria and Cairo from you based on a belief that did not exist 10 or 15 years ago. You will soon see how Islam shook Byzantium during the years 600 to 1000 as they would besiege it twice, even three times. It also encourages the Bulgarians. The Bulgars are besieging Istanbul or making a show of force. In fact, the Bulgarian kingdom is rising significantly. While Islam was eroding the Byzantine Empire, five dynasties in China began to rise with Buddhism. Until the year 600 in China, there was a lot of competition. There wasn't much unification, the Tang dynasty and so on. However, between 600 and 1000, they will gradually begin to gain power in China. Yeah. The troubles for Islam arise with the assassination of Caliph Umar by a Persian slave. This expansion takes a pause for a while. The caliphate period of Caliph Osman begins. He is the third caliph. During Osman's caliphate, the Quran was written down for the first time. The issue here is that Huts. Osman actually has desires for conquest, but Islam's teachings from Hazi Osman to Hazi during the transition period to Ali, some issues begin to arise such as why one becomes a leader, why another becomes a leader, and why someone else becomes a caliph, leading to some complications. In fact, when Hazrat Osman was killed by Egyptian soldiers in 656, a dilemma arose about whether the caliphate would continue through election or come from lineage. Those who do not recognize Hazrat Ali's caliphate are emerging. The Syrian Umayyad, Emir, Muawiyah is claiming the caliphate. This is Kerbala, the massacre of Hassan and Hussein, etc. These are separate topics that require discussion. However, I will skip these areas with your permission as they touch upon various beliefs. One way or another, there was a period of further chaos during the time of Hazrat Ali in Islam. At the same time, in Britain, Christianity is battling pagan kings. In other words, the entire world is actually engaged in religious belief wars. The 600s were years when the world was trying to choose its beliefs. Christianity perhaps encountered Islam in the East under certain conditions, but in England, as you will see shortly, in the 700s, 800s and 900s, the Vikings began to attack Britain. That is, the churches of England, they were plundering. The emergence of the Vikings in history, pagan kingdoms, at the forefront of Christianity, until the year 680, the turmoil within Islam provides a respite for Byzantium. Byzantium is starting to recover a bit. In 680, both the Bulgarians and the Islamic world begin to strike against Byzantium. They will face difficulties once again. In 661, Herzi Ali is being killed, if you notice. None of the last three caliphs I mentioned died a natural death. And here, with Muawiyah declaring himself caliph, the division within the Islamic world increases. One way or another, by the year 690, the Arabs had taken control of Armenia under the belief of Islam. Now they are diverging into two branches. Part of them, which I will explain to you later, will be seen shortly. While advancing from the Mediterranean and North Africa all the way to Spain, some will focus on the siege of Istanbul and move towards Istanbul, heading into the interior of Anatolia. They first besiege Istanbul in 677. Capturing Istanbul is a significant goal for the Islamic faith. It is believed that this was prophesied during the life of Prophet Muhammad, 
There is such a belief, therefore Istanbul is being besieged but with a fire known as Greek fire, which can burn on water as well. It is said that the formula has now been lost, but there is a suggestion that it involves a mixture of oil and petroleum. Thus, they are repelled by the Greek fire during the siege of Istanbul. In 677, the Arabs suffer significant losses here. They establish a 30-year truce with the Byzantines. But the Bulgarians say this siege, the Byzantines were not that perfect, and in 681, four years later, they declared themselves the Bulgarian Empire. So the Bulgarians are also rising up. If you look at the border now, Istanbul, which is referred to as Constantinople, is the last major territory remaining in the hands of the Byzantine Empire during that period. And from the east, the Arabs. And from the west, the Bulgarians began the siege and pressure. In 680, El Hussein bin Ali, was in Karbala. Muhammad's grandson, of course, is important in this context. He is left without water during the siege and is killed upon surrender. But in 685, Abd al-Malik ascended to the Caliphate and introduced the concept of the dinar. Now there is an event related to Islam. During its period of expansion, Islam used a single currency, the dinar. Therefore, if you look at it from the perspective of the European Union logic, the Islamic Union is actually a very strong concept. It has its own currency, like the euro, its official language is Arabic everywhere, just like English is in Europe. It is establishing a communication and intelligence system. What happens in the east and west of the Islamic world? They receive the news instantly. In 699, Carthage falls. The fall of Carthage was a great loss for Byzantium as they were losing their last territories in North Africa. In 710, the Islamic army under the command of Tariq ibn Ziyad advanced through North Africa and landed in Spain via the Strait of Gibraltar. Now this expansion instills great fear in the Pope. Europe, while preoccupied with the troubles of Byzantium, suddenly realizes that they have advanced through North Africa and emerged on the other side of Europe. Therefore, the Arabs' expansionism, which I experienced when I visited Spain, led me to explore the magnificent site known as the Cordoba Church, also referred to as the Mosque of Cordoba, which, like Hagia Sophia, served both as a mosque and a church. There, attempts were made to erase the traces of Islam, but when they later reclaimed the motifs that appeared square-like and were written in Kufi script during the Islamic period, they did not understand them, mistaking them for mere motifs, and left them as they were. Therefore, those verses and writings remain there. The traces of Islam continue to exist in Spain. In summary, in 717, they come to lay siege to Istanbul once again, but they are not able to capture it, and the Arabs suffer heavy losses. However, the advance into Europe continues until the year 732. The trouble arises when a battle is lost around France, and there, Islam is halted. Because the farther you move from your center, the more difficult it becomes to reinforce your troops. And remember that the Arabs know how to fight in the heat and struggle as they move north. This is another issue regarding the division of Islam. The year is 747. The Abbasids are revolting in Khorasan and declaring their own caliphate. This is a great distress. Because the division within yourselves began at that time, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, etc. This creates a problem that you need to resolve within yourselves and on the outside. While the Visigoths may no longer exist, it is known as an opportunity within Europe to expel you from Spain, from the Iberian Peninsula. In 750, the last Umayyad Caliph was already fighting against the Abbasids and fled to Egypt. There, he was captured and killed and the Caliphate passed to the Abbasids. The transfer of the Caliphate to the Abbasids creates some advantages and disadvantages. Let me tell you about it. Some are causing the weakening of the unity, but this time the Abbasids are also turning their eyes to the east. They are taking the kingdom of Tashkent on the Silk Road from the hands of China. China is starting to get really scared. They say, I was already dealing with the Turks, and now the Arabs have come up. We can actually say that this marks the beginning of the turmoil in Asia. There is the Battle of the Talas River, which is also very important. In the Battle of Talas River, the presence of Islam becomes an even greater threat. During this period, they learn to make paper, since we have already entered towards China. Therefore, the practice of writing works on paper instead of on deerskin began during this period. But remember, the reason Islam has not left behind many works, is that engraving is prohibited in Islam. In other words, you cannot draw the shape of the Prophet or any belief, you cannot create engravings of them. There was no art of painting. How is that not the case? I mean, you could draw tulips and so on, but the biggest factor in the spread of Christianity is that when you go to a church, a chapel or a cathedral, 
right behind the altar, it starts from creation and goes all the way to the Day of Judgment, with verses from the Bible, depicted like a comic book. If you go to Tin Chopel, you will see it on the ceiling. In Islam, there is no other work, besides the Quran in mosques. You can't learn religion like a comic book. This is why Christianity spread more rapidly in its time. Islam spreads a bit later for this reason, because the Quran is not being translated to you by someone in order to read the Quran. In the year 756, the Caliphate passed to the Abbasids, but the region of Spain was still under the control of the Umayyads, and the last remaining Umayyads there declared the Kingdom of Cordoba. The year is 762, and the Islamic Baghdad in the east under the Abbasids begins to rise, becoming an Islamic empire. Look, this is very important. When you look at 762-620, that's 150 years. In 150 years, you are starting a belief. This belief transforms into an empire 150 years later, encompassing Cairo, Alexandria, the Armenian side, the eastern side of China, and centered around Baghdad, which was the center of the world at that time, truly central. Because there is life on the Turtigan side, on the Maya side in North Africa, and in South Africa, but the world is unaware of it. The Mayans have emerged on the stage of history, already doing something significant. Later, the Mayans will be noticed, a massacre of the society will occur, and the Spaniards, Genoese, and others will seize their gold. But if we look at the center of the world right now, Baghdad is the center of the world. Things were not going well for the Christian world. Islam was spreading. However, in the year 770, a great opportunity arose. A man named Charlemagne emerged. He gathered all the Franks together. Do you know what we call Frank, Francia? If you look at its root, it actually resembles the French, but it is actually a Germanic tribe. Now, when you look here, we refer to France and Germany as the Franks. If you pay attention today, the origins of the European Union also started with France and Germany. Schalman begins to unite Europe so rapidly, both politically and religiously, that during his reign, his territories expand very quickly. In 770, the ideology of unifying Europe into a single kingdom is truly progressing successfully. This also prevents the spread of Islam in Europe. Perhaps if Shalman had not been born in 770 as a chance for Christianity, Islam would be a more widespread religion in Europe today. Now that we are discussing the period between 600 and 1000, the year has come to 800. Let's pause here. If we are in the middle of the story, let's take a look at the world. As you can see, the Franks, influenced by Shaman, have a population of 13 million and they occupy quite a large area. What we are currently discussing is actually at the core of the European Union. They are at the foundation of the European Union. The Byzantine Empire is still not dead. Now, here is the important point. We refer to the continuation of Rome, Eastern Rome, and Byzantium. But, one way or another, they hold an area very close to today's Turkey borders and currently manage a population of 7.4 million. We are talking about Europe. We are not looking at the sides that the Abbasid Caliphate carries the flag of Islam. But in Europe, the emirate in Cordoba has a significant population of Islam with 3.4 million people. Besides that, the most important thing that interests me here is the Papal State. The area we refer to as the Papal State is the yellow region you see. That is the papacy. From that time on, the papacy begins to become autonomous and to have its own structure. This is where the difference between Islam and Christianity starts. The Papal State was always autonomous and received tax revenues from Christians in other countries. There has never been such a center in Islam. As you can see, the emergence of the papal state here is very significant. Another story is that if you look towards England, there are the Irish kingdoms. This means that Ireland has started to form, but not all of Britain is in the hands of things. The British have 0 0.3. You know, the 13th number is the Britonic kingdoms. Not all of it is in the hands of the Britons, the ancestors of the English. England has not yet turned into a Briton. The greatest power there right now is the Wessex. But one way or another, we can say that a European Union had begun for Europe at that time. The problem in Damascus is that it wants to have a single ruler. However, the Saxons are having issues with the pagans. On one hand, they are bringing them under their own control. They are seizing Italy in the east and south. 
They start with France and Germany, but you can already see with the map on the screen, during his time, he quickly conquers Europe. The chance for Islam comes in the year 789. During this 20-year period, while Sharman's influences are developing Europe, Harun al-Rashid becomes caliph in Baghdad in 789. Harun al-Rashid is a smart man. He sends gifts to Sharman. He does not want to experience chaos with him. And do you know what the most beautiful thing he did in his time was? He valued book covers. In Greek, they translate as many books as possible from various languages into Arabic and contribute them to Arabic libraries. In fact, some books from the Greek culture later disappear. And the Arabic commentary is being translated back from its Arabic version to be introduced to Greek libraries 300 years later. Harun al-Rashid played a significant role in ensuring that the world cultural heritage was not lost during this transitional period. Islam was also drawing cultural influences from Hellenism during that period. It incorporated knowledge from various sources. It began to learn the teachings of Plato, Aristotle, and others. Therefore, it was acquiring knowledge in both philosophy and mathematics. Thinkers began to emerge in Islam. The initial focus of Islam on art, philosophy, and thought actually started after the years 789-790. From this point on, it begins to evolve into a more philosophical religion. Within Iran, an Iranian Arab synthesis emerges, but contact with India adds mathematics and various knowledge to the Arabs and Islam, which then appears as information to be sold to Europe. Thus, Islam begins to spread to Europe as well. In the 8th century, the issue is that, especially in the middle of Asia, both Islam and China are spreading very rapidly. And in the end, they absorb everything so quickly that they come and clash, uniting at a border. What they do not take into account is the Turks and the Tibetans. They also do not leave Central Asia empty. Therefore, when we look at the scale of the surroundings of Asia, rather than Byzantium or Eastern Rome, the Turks, Tibetans, Arabs, and Chinese are trying to share Asia. All of them are imperial powers. The empire is not a gang or anything like that in a significant sense, because when you look at Europe, there are early small kingdoms, very small ones. In fact, if we go further east, Japan is being established. Here, the kingdoms of Japan are emerging. In the same period, in the 8th century, the Vikings were advancing as invaders, causing widespread bloodshed until the 11th century. Meanwhile, if I'm not mistaken, they have a series on National Geographic. I also saw it on Netflix. They have a great series about the life of the Vikings. It has moved on to the fourth season, right there in the sixth and seventh episodes of the first season. It starts to tell about this Englishman raiding churches in Britain and the British Isles. They are jumping on the ships. These ships are not exactly the kind that will cross the ocean, but at least they go as far as England. And they see that there is gold. There are churches, there is life, there is a modern life, and they begin to plunder. Until the 11th century, we will see the Vikings as quite the warriors and raiders. Here, the weakening of Eastern Rome coincides with the strengthening of the charm in 792. In the year 792, a young friend of ours at the head of the Eastern Rome Empire says that he wants to ascend the throne together with his mother. My mother says she knows everything better. I will also become a co-emperor with her. They don't make a sound because they are foolish. Do you know what is happening? After four years, his mother is going to have his eyes altered and declare himself an emperor. Shaman seizes this opportunity and says, I will take the Pope with me, and from now on, you will adopt my imperial authority. Harun al-Rashid remains silent, saying, Let them eat each other, let the dog eat the dog. Consequently, with Islam not intervening at all, and with the support of the Pope, Shalman gains considerable strength. He declares himself the emperor of Rome. A war occurs between Byzantium and the Bulgarian Khan in the 8th to 11th centuries. They have become quite weakened, it is said. Let's strike a blow to the fallen. The Byzantine emperor is killed. The Bulgarian Khan is also preparing for a raid. I apologize for mentioning the skull, but it's an important idea in history. He covers the skull with silver and starts carrying it around constantly. He drinks wine from it, and while doing so, he becomes determined, saying, I will take Istanbul, my pasha. Since the Arabs have attacked, I will take it too. Kushatiyama is making a mistake. Not only is he failing his goal, the Bulgar reputation declines. In 814, Sharman dies. When he died, he had brought a magnificent golden age for the Franks lasting 45 years. This marks the first establishment of the European Union. 
Then, of course, it will disband again from the very beginning. Now, you see a newly established European Union that is on the verge of disbanding. Note that during that time, the Saxons and Britain were causing problems for the European Union. Today, England is also causing issues for the European Union. On the Islamic side, there are two beautiful things from the same period. The first is the House of Wisdom, the House. Think of it as a cultural center. This is a place that spreads knowledge to the world from every book and every education. In fact, the book Al-Jaba, the book of algebra, is being translated into Arabic. Islam and the Arabs greatly benefit from mathematics and algebra. It goes as far as astronomy, observatories and such were established during the reign of Harun al-Rashid. So we are talking about a period when Islam was not ignorant, but very knowledgeable. If you look at Arabia right now, the people there are not particularly intelligent. Their IQs are not high. They are trying to act as if they are knowledgeable with their money. But that period was not a time of ignorance for Islam. The Anglo-Saxons are relevant for England. When we refer to the Anglo-Saxons, we are talking about the three tribes that settled in England, in Britain, in the mid fifth century, the Angles, the Jutes, and the Saxons. These are the Germanic tribes, and actually the roots of English, the roots of the English people. There are very few cultures in the world that are as deeply rooted and ancient as those we still see today. The Turks are one of them, the Anglo-Saxons are another, and of course, the Germans. After Shalman died, this European Union of the Franks continues for a while, but his son is someone who has lost his mind with such beliefs. He doesn't interfere much, he neither loses territory nor makes conquests, he is of no use at all. The trouble lies with the descendants, Daslak Charles and the German called Ludwig. They say, let's either divide this Frank land in two or even into three parts. To share it, bald Charles is taking the current France, the large portion. Ludwig is taking the side of Germany. They will later fragment even more, but for now, they are dividing into two. It actually seems like a single kingdom, but they divide it into two separate structures. This causes a significant problem. Because this Daslak Charles is a bit foolish, in 847 he says that every free individual should find themselves a master, a lord. He is making the mistake of his life, he is making a big mistake for Europe, for France, because free people say, if I am going to choose a lord for myself, then I will eat the central authority, I will eat the king, and so on. I need to find someone strong, who will protect me from Viking attacks, local raids, and gangs. Do you know what this creates? Feudalism emerges. Feudalism is a system of lordship. So, today, in the East, there is this dominance where you manage the land, and everyone starts working for you, and so on. After a while, regional administrations begin to emerge without any need for a king. In fact, within a period of about 200 years, these feudal principalities, let's call them aristocracy, will rebel and declare their own freedoms, saying, I will take your place, king. The rumor is that you will wonder if nothing good ever happened. It is said that during this time, a shepherd named Kaldi, an Ethiopian shepherd, noticed that while herding his goats, they became extremely energetic, sweet and interesting after eating a red berry. He wondered what it was, gathered some and took them to a Sufi dervish. He looks and says that such things are just nonsense, it's not nice, and throws it into the fire. Suddenly a very pleasant smell fills the room. He then says, let's stop and brew some to drink. Coffee is served there. There is much occurring now. Tatarstan is entering Europe. The war system of Tatarstan is changing. It becomes a great trouble for infantry and cavalry. The multiple firing system of Tatarstan is used by the Chinese. It is also spreading in Europe. You can shoot five or six arrows at once and cover a very long distance. In 863, Saint Cyril introduced the Cyrillic alphabet, claiming that he would spread Christianity. The world's first book, about five meters tall, is emerging. We call it a book, but it's more like something you would scroll through on a tablet or internet pages, where you keep scrolling continuously. The Diamond Sutra, dated to the year 868, is found in a cave. Fortunately, it is referred to as an ancient book. During this period, at the end of the 800s and the beginning of the 900s, the Khazar Empire emerges, and it observes that the Arabs have chosen Islam, while the Byzantines have chosen Christianity. It then decides not to follow the same path as them, and chooses Judaism. One of the moves that ensured the survival of Judaism in the world is this. The year 937 is very important for the world, especially for Europe, particularly for England. An Anglo-Saxon king wins a battle against the Vikings and five other kings with seven households. This is significantly changing the map of Europe and its destiny permanently. It both halts the Galileans and Scotland and marks the beginning of the Vikings' exit from the historical stage. 
Moreover, the foundations of the state of England are being laid. The year 1981 is significant as it marks the year when El Mansur defeated Christianity and spread Islam in Morocco and Algeria. The year 683 is also an important year during this period. To summarize, there is the uprising of Kutlu Khan. The Turks and Tibetans are causing significant problems for China. In 712-713, the Arabs captured Bukhara, Samarkand, and the regions beyond the Amu Darya, posing a major threat to the Chinese. Remember that this 400-year period, from 600 to 1000, was marked by a great conflict involving the Chinese, Tibetans, Turks, and Islam. For Europe, there was no particularly bright period outside of the Shalman era. The last two pieces of information suggest that in the year 750, the world population is estimated to be 220 million. Of this, 60 million are Indian, China has 50 million, the rest of Europe has 40 million, and the entire Europe has 25 million. By the year 1000, the world population had reached 280, 300 million, with 6 million Italians, 3 million Germans, and 5 million French. Gradually shaping Europe, this period may be the most boring one we encounter while skipping through world history. But it is an interesting period because we witnessed the birth of a religion. I had previously told you about the birth of Christianity. We witnessed the birth of Islam. After the year 1000, we will see periods where empires clash and wars occur. I hope you are enjoying it. The World History series continues from where it left off. I am Haluk Tatar. See you in the next video.